Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice-activated sync with sync services, which enables you to customize your driving experience with personalized news, traffic, and directions. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. it's frame rate welcome to frame rate episode 55 we can't episode. Actually, d- uh, earlier, Brian couldn't drive 55 because the traffic was so bad. He couldn't even get up to 55. And now we can't hear Brian. Traffic was on the way back in. But wait, what an amazing world in which, like, while I'm driving, I can uh, turn on my iPhone, set it up there, and press the Justin TV app. Instantly, 150 people watching me stuck in traffic, and I'm able to say, I don't know if I'll make it to frame rate on time. Can you guys help me pick an opening video? And that beautiful gem shows up. Do you like the? So you're tra- you're trying to you're trying to blame the audience is what you're saying. Wait, blame them? What are you talking about? They say this this shows off to the rockin'est start we've ever had. We had robots kicking over children and and eyes exploding with gunshots and diseases. It was awesome. Uh, you know, when you describe it like that, I like it better than I liked it when I watched it. <laughs> well, why don't we do this? From now on, I'll just describe an awesome clip, and that will be better than actual whatever clip we come up that, with. And can that'll you, work out a lot better for the audio su- listeners, too. Right? Submit descriptions of your clips in writing, please. Yes. Uh, awesome. Yeah, exactly. The audio listeners will like that, too. Uh, let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. Steel Reporter says that Verizon is considering buying Netflix. Uh, after late last week, uh, Verizon CEO Lowell McAdams said, "Oh, we're not. We looked at buying Hulu. We're not going to buy Hulu, uh, but we do have a video strategy we're looking at. Uh, there was rumors that it was going to be uh, CoinStar. Well, they would partner up with Redbox. That still might happen. Uh, right. There was a rumor that they were going to put out their own." streaming system outside of areas where they offer Verizon Fios. Uh, And then yesterday, uh, Porter Bibb, a media analyst citing unnamed people inside Verizon, said that Verizon is very serious about a potential offer for Netflix. Now, okay, now is is this a case where, because Verizon has, according to the article, been sort of on the lookout saying but not saying that they want to get into the video streaming arena. Uh, is this a case where somebody just saw the right matchup, or do you think this really is a courtship happening behind the scenes? Because it seems like this is a very expensive way for Verizon to go about starting an online movie streaming business. And there's a lot of weirdness to this idea, too, because remember, we're talking about Verizon, not Verizon Wireless. This throws people off a lot of times. Verizon Wireless is a joint company of Vodafone and Verizon. Verizon that we're talking about here is the parent company, and they are the folks who provide telephony and all kinds of other uh, services like, like cable through Wireline. Now, because they provide cable with their Verizon Fios service, their Verizon Fios television service, you're going to have issues with programmers saying, well, we don't want Verizon to be providing Netflix because that competes with us. So we're going to pull our programming from Verizon Fios or we're going to charge it more. 
So, but understand also, there are some things that I really like about the idea of a merger between Verizon and Netflix. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it seems to me like a, a, a side result of this would be that Verizon would suddenly lose any benefit to putting bandwidth caps out there. Because if they own Netflix and they want to promote people watching stuff on Netflix, they want people to open oh. up that bandwidth. Oh, Brian. Oh, Brian, my uh, naivete. Uh, this means that Verizon would have an interest in exempting Netflix from your bandwidth cap were they to, uh, to buy that. Well, now, hold on just a second. That seems like that would be an unfair business practice, and I don't believe that kind of thing happens in America, sir. Uh, well, it could. There'd be nothing against <laughs> the law. Man, it's uh, I, it, I just I just don't see Verizon courting this because they just signed a deal with Spectrum Co, which is backed by several cable companies. Uh, and as essentially what they've agreed to, as I understand it, is they're not going to expand their television business into any of the areas uh, outside of where Verizon Fios already exists. But they are talking about uh, cooperating to sell things like Comcast outside of areas where Verizon exists. So it wouldn't make sense for me to, to me that they would start a streaming business in the areas where they sell Verizon Fios. Plus, they're going to be going up against these guys who hate Netflix. Uh, I, I, there's some, okay. I haven't quite figured out the twist to this. Like, d does Verizon buy Netflix and then gut it uh, and, and turn it into, you know, the cable television industry's dream where it's only provided to people who already have some other kind of television service? It's no, I, I, well, first of all, like, to do that would be idiotic. Now, I'm not saying they're not going to do it, but that would be very expensive and a very stupid way to do it because Netflix has a tremendously powerful brand name now. It's, what, 15, 13, 14 years into its brand? I thought Quickster had the brand. Oh, no, it's Netflix that has the brand name. Right. Exactly, right? Well, and as they understood, with the moment they tried to divorce even a piece of what Netflix meant, everyone went totally nuts with you know, calling it Quickster and starting from scratch was not a good idea. And that's essentially what they would be doing if they were to rebrand it as, you know, Verizon Movie Club or whatever they want to call it. Um, the, uh, I, I don't know. I just don't. Is there a chance? And this is crazy conspiracy talk. I don't know a single thing about the stock market, but this seems like the kind of move that if my if I owned a lot of Netflix and the Netflix stock was so very low value that it's seen a giant dip lately, seems like takeover rumors would be a good way to kind of goose up the stock. Didn't it spike up like 6% today? Uh, well, yesterday, yeah. It, it yes. spiked up at 6% at one point. I've, I've had the same crazy conspiracy theory thought, which is, <laughs> is Reed Hastings clever enough yeah. to orchestrate this? Uh, in order, because it is all just rumor, right? Lowell McAdam only said that they had looked at buying Hulu, and that indicates that they're serious about possibly purchasing a streaming service, and decided not to in that case. Uh, all the rest of it's rumors, so I, I, I'm not saying that this is orchestrated by Reed Hastings or somebody else, but it's it's an intriguing, you know, crazy theory. Well, to think, a, you know, like, of, oh, in the movie version, Reed Hastings is out there planting all these rumors that then spike up the uh, the Netflix price and save the stock. There's an awful lot of shareholders who have a vested interest in passing along a rumor of, of this variety. And it could be one yeah. of those things that just organically bubbles up. Uh, I'm gonna I make, doubt it. I'm going to say two things. First of all, I'm going to predict this will not go through. Uh, but if it did, well, first of all, would you, you say this is the real deal or not at all? I think this is a very small percentage chance that, that, that Netflix would want to sell, first of all, and that Verizon would want to buy them. Well, and, and that's, the, that's the thing, is that you've got, you've got a seller that doesn't make sense because Netflix is, is, is poised to be the pioneer of transforming the way we consume media and watch movies and television. Uh, and, and they seem to be, with, with some hiccups, mitigating the entire uh, event well. Uh, and then you've got uh, Verizon, who this would be a very foolish roundabout way for them to get into the movie streaming game, which eh, it seems like would be an ancillary source of income for them at best. Yeah. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Google chairman Eric Schmidt speaking on stage at the web said the following, and these are his words. By the summer of 2012, the majority of the televisions that you see in stores will have Google TV embedded in them. All right, now keep in mind, put this in perspective. We're okay. still, it's, it's December of 2011, and yeah. if I say by, dis, by summer 2012, that can still sound pretty far off. Yeah, in well, order, just the fact that it's the 2000s to someone of Eric Schmidt's age sounds like it's in the future. 
Yes, yes. Well, maybe that's what he means. Maybe he was momentarily high and he, he thought he was talking about the year 3000. But, but think In about this. In the faraway no. world of 2012. <laughs> so he's saying that in stores... In summer 2012, you will be at the majority of televisions you have. Yes, that you see. Have Google installed. Yeah, which when means, you go to the store and you look at televisions, the majority of them will have Google TV embedded. Okay. So, wait, okay, wait, that wait. means if that's going to happen, that yes, means they're yes. already building the TVs with Google in them. And he is which the chairman of Google. Deal. So, is he just saying well, that we've got a bunch of people building Google TVs? Uh, well, here's the thing. This could be the kind of thing where I, I don't know the nature of the speeches that they give at LeWeb, if this is something where you're speaking extemporaneously and he can say something like that because he knows the deals have already been inked. But uh, it, uh, that's what I'm saying is the fact that this is such a close deadline. It's literally right around the corner. It's, it is, it is, you are correct. If the TVs aren't being manufactured right now, they're being, they're going to be manufactured over the next three months and they're going to be finished in, in, no time you don't say something like that unless either one you're just you you forgot your numbers and 2012 means 2013 to you in crazy yeah. time i kind or, of feel like that's what he meant i feel and, and i haven't seen any clarification on it but i kind of feel like he had to have meant summer of 2013 then it's at least possible right yes well, it's not only possible, but I believe it will happen because if there's one thing we've seen from the behavior of Google, uh, it's search results notwithstanding. Google, of course, rose to prominence on the fact that it had the best search engine. But since then, you've seen them put tendrils in a lot of really interesting spaces, and many of them involve colossal missteps. But they've, if there's one thing they've shown is they have no problem chopping off that appendage and growing a new one, trying, you know, like a Borg type thing. Like, look what they did with social media. You know, first it was, uh, forget whatever one's popular in Brazil, but then it was Buzz and then, you know, and then Wave. And then elements of all these show up in Google+. And even Google+, Plus is being tweaked and refined because they have the resources to keep moving forward. It's obvious that they're committed to the idea of owning a seamless, um, beautiful interface that changes the way you view television. Now, granted, uh, the, the Logitech review crumbled, and part of that was because Logitech overbet on it. They, uh, they overproduced and under Although they just upgraded the review, and it's, it's much more usable. At 99 bucks, it's totally worth it. Well, well exactly. And, and again, that's all software refinement. So it's obvious that they're committed to it. And if, if Google's committed to something, and they have the resources to keep plowing forward, I got to feel that it's, it's a real deal if they say this is going to happen by this time. Uh, and, and maybe they'll be wrong on the deadline. They were wrong when it came to having a legitimate social media application, but they eventually got there with Google+, and I think that's exactly what you're going to see with the Google TV. Now, Peter Kafka at All Things D may or may not also know how close we are to 2012, as we will see in yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Peter Kafka on All Things D says why you'll buy TV on the web in 2012. Uh, talking about Rich Greenfield, a, uh, a, uh, an analyst, uh, who says that 2012 will be the first time we'll see a true virtual cable company offering in the U.S. where consumers can subscribe to TV delivered over the web. Different than on-demand services like Netflix and Hulu, uh, offering up programming that's already been on TV. This will give you access to real TV in real time. Essentially what he's saying is he is he is predicting the launch of the first virtual cable provider where yeah. it's like you got the dumb pipe, you've got, you know, 20 megabits down, which can get you a reliable signal. All of a sudden, instead of actually having Time Warner have the infrastructure to get you 300 channels, you will virtually as a, as a uh, kind of a, 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 a kind of a Justin TV uh, situation or, or a, um, a single channel video on demand type thing, you'll be able to flip channels and there'll be providers who are able to sell the exact same content at a massive, massive discount with razor thin margins. And now, so Greenfield is the one who's saying this is going to happen next year. Uh, I, I think the headline is crazy on this, why you'll buy TV on the web in 2012. I think somebody might do this by the end of next year. They'd have to get the programmers on board. That's not impossible, but it's a tall order. Greenfield also told Kafka he thinks the first player will be somebody who's not already in there. So it won't be an Amazon. It won't be an Apple. It won't be a Microsoft. It'll be somebody who's not in the playing field who will want to do this. The question is, what it's will the ISP's response be to this if those ISPs are cable companies like Comcast and Time Warner? Here's, here's the good news. Okay, now, and this was mentioned in the article, right, that part of uh, existing agreements with mergers insisted that they be prepared for situations like this and that they commit 
to not choking down bandwidth of competitors, right? Let me see if I can find um, the virtual cable company will have to cut distribution deals just like uh, just like all the big guys. So um, have to, they have to give a cut to the ISPs is what yeah, you're saying. There we go. Note, when the feds blessed the Comcast NBC deal this year, they required the company to make its programming available to this kind of competitor. So there is good mm, that they so that gives a leg up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and there will be outliers who go ahead and try this, and there will be consumers like me who are just, I'm this close. I mean, I swear, if you told me that I could get just five channels, just five channels to give to the kids, uh, I would I would cut the, I would cancel my, my uh, Time Warner phone, I would cancel my Time Warner cable altogether, I would go with their highest tier, wideband, $99 a month package, that's 50 megabits down and five megabits up uh, instantly, and I, and I would pay another... 40 50 60 dollars on top of it for the virtual provider as well because this is a fascinating opportunity to completely change the role of the time warners and comcast out there and make them dumb pipe providers which is i think what we all really want them to be now our final story is probably not such a big story since it's our fourth big story but still it's the fourth big story <laughs> it's a story you made the cut what's that brian I said, it's a story. You made the cut. You don't you need to put it. Cut. It's all number four. Uh, this the- is from Will <laughs> Richmond at uh, Video News via paidcontent.org. The title is, The Albert Pujols Deal Shows What's Wrong with the Pay TV Business. Now, this is some tortured logic, especially okay. if you don't follow baseball. Uh, thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I opened this story up and I saw a dude playing baseball and then it said something, 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 big deal with a guy who hits a ball some way. And I was just like, I'm going to rely on Tom to explain to me what any of this means. Okay, so the, the baseball go. part of it is pretty simple. You don't have to know anything about baseball except that Albert Pujols is one of the best players in baseball. And he okay. just signed a ridiculously large contract with the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. A 10-year deal worth $254 million and a no-trade clause, which means they can't get rid of him unless he says it's okay. Right. They okay. Can, so he, it's it's one of those ridiculous sports deals. Now here's what Will Richmond says: the Angels' ability to pull off this deal uh, falls right in line with a post he made earlier called "Not a Sports Fan." Then you're getting sacked for two billion dollars a year, where he explained that massive player contracts and sports rights programming fees are being subsidized by non-sports fans. In the Pujol situation, the Angels appear to have leveraged a new 20-year, $3 billion rights deal with Fox Sports West to be able to afford Pujols, as well as another pitcher, C.J. Wilson. Uh, And Major League Baseball apparently allowed Angels owner Artie Moreno to opt out of his prior deal with Fox halfway through it so he could renegotiate at dramatically higher fees. Those fees are paid by the cable companies who then pass the savings along to you and raise your cable rates. So if you don't care about baseball or not, you're paying higher cable costs. Okay, so here's the thing. Number one, this sort of makes sense, and it's sort of this, I feel like this will be a crucible that honestifies the big cable experience. And what I mean by that is when you ask people why they don't cut the cord, when you ask people why they don't just rely on, you know, Netflix and iTunes for all their entertainment needs, they, it's all, the, the, the main thing you always hear is sports. Well, I want to have sports available. And, you know, and even for me, somebody who has stated for three years he wants to cut the cord, still hasn't done it. Part of it is because my father-in-law comes over and he wants to see this this game or this this golf match or whatever. And I don't want to be the ungracious host and say like whatever oldie you can't watch live content and i'm not going to introduce them to Ustream pirated feeds of, of any of that stuff but what this will do is it will number one it, it honestifies the reasons to keep cable and it increases the premium and i feel like it will in many ways uh encourage people to full-on decide well seriously the only reason to bother to watch stuff live is because you want to be there on the big premiere events or for sports, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the Lord Nikon in the chat room says, to be fair, sports stars shouldn't even be making anywhere near that much. That's the point of this article, which is we have a subsidy model going on, and the Internet will get rid of that subsidy model because only yes. people who want to watch the thing are going to pay for the thing. Uh, right. That's, that's coming. It may be 10, 20 years away before it gets here, possibly, but it's coming where people are going to say, you know what, I have choice now, and I'm going to exercise that choice. Uh, so those of you in the chat room is like, ah, oh, you lost me at baseball. You need to listen past you lost yeah, me at baseball. Because we're not talking about baseball. We're talking about the fact that you 
yourself, if you pay for any kind of television, are paying for something you don't need and subsidizing it. And, and especially with sports, because sports stations are the ones who are able to get the highest carriage fees on these, on these cable television networks. It's not the DIY networks and the TLCs. Uh, in fact, as I, as I learned at Tech TV, some networks actually have to pay to get carried. Uh, so it, it works both ways. Uh, so, ESPN so, so, always if, gets paid. If there's one thing you guys should take away at home, you are paying for this. You personally, if you have traditional cable, you have personally donated money to a, to a star athlete in a, in a show you don't even watch for a game you could care less about. This is something that should be of great concern to you. If you're somebody who rolls your eyes at sports, you should be blowing up. If you're somebody who loves sports, you should be uh, frustrated about what's being done in, in the name of, of uh, an entertainment form that you love. It's sports solism. Solipsisms. Yeah, so, it's so, it's so, it's sportialism. It's sports, so <laughs> sportialism. Yeah, that's it. I heard Obama's a sportialist. Ah, uh, yeah. That. Sir, I want to see time. Albert Pujol's birth certificate, too. All right, let's take a uh, quick break. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice-activated sync with sync services, including personalized news, traffic, and directions. Brian, in your long trek home to get ready for frame rate, you could have had personalized news, traffic, and directions from Sync Services, enabling you to personalize your driving experience. So whenever you get in your car, you can always have access to the information you want. Personalized alerts for sports, news, stocks, even horoscopes. Uh, personalized traffic alerts on frequently traveled routes via an available in-dash display or read to you as you drive. Uh, letting you know, hey, you know, traffic's all backed up on 35, might want to take Mopac uh, or something like that. Sent to your mobile device via SMS before you get in the car. And Sync users can personalize their account with the information they want at Ford.com slash Sync. Ford Sync with Sync services, personalized traffic and information services are available in the 2012 Ford Focus. And you can learn more about this and other Ford technologies at Ford.com slash technologies check it out we're going to be driving some fords this week i'm excited uh they're sending us a bunch of a bunch of cars to try out and drive around i will enjoy watching you drive those fords as i sit alone well you can always fly out you know you, you, you fly everywhere on a whim don't you well i used i, I did but now i'm going to be flying out to twit once a week so no, that's, that's true good. well then do we yeah well well you can just drive leo's mustang next time you come done and done You're like hold on uncle leo Burp, you know, well. <laughs> let's move on to tube tops You know, I think for uh, 2012, which is so far away, I know, but uh, I think for 2012, we should think about uh, rejiggering our categories here. Because oh, I, I, huh. real, I realize we're getting a lot of more stories about web services these days that don't really fit neatly into television or film. Yeah, it, well, it, and I, I think that's, that's, that's certainly in line with the blurring lines of media in general that yeah, we've yeah. seen over the last, uh, the last year and a half or so. So it's, yeah, it, I mean, what seemed like you know, clear-cut categories, what, in summer of 2010? Yeah, I know. Like at the end of 2011. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, we need a Netflix category, said somebody in the chat room. Uh, FCC finally cracking down on blaring TV ads, issuing rules requiring television broadcasters and cable and satellite providers to maintain constant volume levels for programs and commercials. This is the Commercial Advertisement Loudness Mitigation Act, better known as the CALM Act. Oh, please. All these forced acronyms. I hate them. It, it kills me. Um, look, here, here's, uh, I did not see this article. When you, was this a late-breaking story? Did you add it just recently? Uh, yeah, this, this was on the register this morning, um, like okay. mid-morning, late morning. So, yeah, it was, it was added later in the day. Okay, well, I missed it. But, uh, but I, I am so torn on this because this is the kind of thing that absolutely I am so sick. Like, there's a part of my brain that says... It's not enough that this is how it is for television. We also need to change it for uh, for all radio, and we need to change it for Pandora. We did we did our Christmas card, and we spent all day listening to Christmas music, and it was like awesome, mellow holiday music, and then it was just loud as, as I don't even, I can't even say the words of how loud and jarring it was for, for these super excited ads for discount deals at Amazon, blah, 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 blah. and it, it drove me nuts. So part of me wants this not only for television but for everything. And part of me doesn't even mind if the government does it. But another part of me is like, man, it kills me that we need to have the government pass a law about it. You want to, you want to have the government pass a law about what kind of ads they need to make anyway? I mean, this is this is something that should have been handled 
by uh, by the people. I mean, this is uh, look. NPR is able to have a specific type of of, of commerce related advertisement that's classy and it's not jarring and it's in line with the who rest of the. Who runs NP? Who funds NPR? Uh, well, uh, uh, viewers like you, is <laughs> this is what it is. But, uh, but uh, I, I don't think it's because the government gives some money to NPR is why they do that. Because this, this is why it, this is why that cable television network is going to launch on the internet because then they 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 won't have to follow these rules. Well, yeah. Well, and well, no, 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 no. But, but, but here's the thing: is if they want to, this can be a. Buy. Right now, you don't have a choice. It's like, well, you're Time Warner, you're Comcast, you're Bright House, or whatever. That's that's who you get. But once all of a sudden the internet providers become dumb pipes, and the uh, you have these virtual cable suppliers, all of a sudden it becomes a unique selling proposition where it's like uh, you can have a, a very specific thing where it's like we're a virtual cable prov provider. We cost exactly five dollars more than our competition, but we tweak the sound of every ad you will receive and you it will be in line with the same volume as everyone else i will pay five dollars for that and it's like it kills me that we're ha that be the only reason we have to use the clumsy hammer of law to fix this is because we have the clumsy hammer of monopoly when it comes to most people selecting their cable provider i think it's mostly old people too frankly because i've noticed as i get older and my hearing goes i have to turn up the tv louder and that's when the commercials start blaring if you don't have to have the TV loud that in the first place, it, ha it never bothered me before. But as my hearing is going, but but understand also, understand also that it's not just. You took me the, seriously. Um, I, well, I mean, no, actually, you, you kind of you're, you're exactly on the money insofar as the they don't actually turn up the volume for the advertisements. Instead, if you if you're looking at the waveform, you've got your. Uh, that is um, that is sometimes a myth. Okay. But, that has been but, debunked in many cases. Although sometimes you're right, an ad is not actually louder. It's just on average hitting spikes. I've, but but actually, they've shown the that whole, there's a lot of ads that are actually just louder all the way through. Well, but if you're watching a suspenseful movie, there are extended periods of quiet and whispers and things that should be quiet to draw you in. And I remember when I worked at the movie theater and Jurassic Park came out, we had a lot of complaints about the sound because it was either too loud or too quiet because they intentionally, when they made Jurassic Park, they wanted the suspense parts to be very very quiet and then all of a sudden the blasting tyrannosaurus would come in and it would go the vu meter would go off the charts this was nothing we could control outside of having a projectionist do this non-stop through the movie and we weren't going to do that so uh this is that is the source of what we are encountering now with advertisements because uh when you when you're telling a story you want quiet parts you want loud parts when you're telling when you're selling a product you want nothing but full attention full loud for your brief 30 seconds of time and nobody hears it anyway because they fast forward all right. Wired reporting that two episodes of Doctor Who from the 1960s that were presumed lost forever have been recovered. Terry Burnett, a former television engineer, bought the recordings of the episodes in the 1980s at a school festival in Hampshire, England, and did not realize they were one of the 100-plus lost Doctor Who episodes. Uh, one of them is from the four-part stories Airlock, uh, the third installment in uh, 1965's Galaxy 4, and the second recovered episode was episode 2 of 1967's The Underwater Menace. So the first one was a William Hartnell and the other one's a Patrick Troughton episode. Uh, there's still something like, I don't remember exactly how much, but a, a hundred more, a hundred or more, 106 episodes between 1964 and 1969 missing. All right, Tom, after our discussion last week about how the exploding popularity of Doctor Who is the most popular it's ever been right now, and there is genuine lost gold in these old episodes out there, mm, mm -hmm. you and me should pitch to Sci-Fi Network Who Hunters, where you and I <laughs> are the world tracking down the last hundred episodes of Doctor Who. <laughs> right, because it's like Ghost Hunters. You don't have to actually find a ghost. Yeah, they don't call it ghost finders. They yeah. call it ghost hunters. Right. We could be who hunters. We can go. We can actually do it in the style of ghost hunters. Travel all over. Oh my gosh! How, yeah, we're scared of. The, did you uh, hear? Did you hear a Doctor Who voice? I think it came from the closet. <laughs> Come on, man! That would be so much fun. We would. That, that would, would be fantastic. I would love I, it if that was my job. The geek stuff. That would be awesome, dude. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I'm in. I'm absolutely <laughs> okay, in. Good. Who hunters? That's. <laughs> Trademark, copyright, Schwood Merit Enterprises yeah, Limited. Yeah, you heard it here. Schwood Merit Enterprises. <laughs> All right. Louis C.K. making some uh, noise because he's giving away, well, actually not giving away, he's charging $5 via PayPal, his Practice. newest stand-up concert, but giving it 
to you directly instead of having to make you wait through the window system of television that has it go to HBO first and then it goes to on demand and this and that. You are the first opportunity to get Louis C.K.'s new stand-up routine. Yeah, what I like about this is uh, this is a really interesting time, and, and I'll mention more about this when it comes to what we're watching, because I watched some media recently that really got me thinking about the bizarre nature of people who create content yet don't own it and how they oftentimes get screwed. Even people who own their own content, but um, they, they sell it for distribution and the, the distributors get an unfair cut of, of what's going on. We, we are entering the age where it's, it's so much more honest, where it's like, you know what, there's a certain sphere of influence I have that I could sell this right now for five dollars and make a million dollars uh, why should I turn them over to you Mr. Big Distributor to to uh, to make money on them and keep half of it and now the rules sort of are okay you know what you created the content go ahead and try to sell it to your to your hundred thousand hardcore followers and make your million dollars uh, and then when you're done with them when you realize that that's as far as your direct influence goes then talk to us and then we can make you you know way more money by reaching all the people that you can't reach on your own uh, I think this is delightful and I and I hope it is a trend in the future as people build their own personal brands they can market to them directly and then figure uh, have a more honest arrangement with large-scale distributors Microsoft is apparently looking uh, for some TV execs, according to Bloomberg, to uh, sign up and maybe produce some original content. The publication's anonymous sources say that two former NBC executives have been approached, but it's not a done deal. Uh, it would not be unprecedented for Microsoft to tap some Hollywood talent. They've done it before. They got uh, Peter Safran to produce a series of short film pilots. Obviously, they had Felicia Day uh, doing The Guild. Uh, for Xbox uh, for a couple seasons, uh, and uh, you know they they they've been, they've got their toes in here before, but it sounds like they might be wanting to get into the business of making content directly for the Xbox. Do you think that this is a direct response to Google? Explain their their hundred million dollar bet, or, or however many, how many billion million? Trillion? Yeah, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a direct response to Google so much as it is part of the constant battle of like who's going to rule your television uh, that that is now in the upswing right uh, well, we have it, it's it's an open playing field is it going to be Netflix is it going to be Xbox is it going to be Apple is it going to be Google is it going to be somebody new is it going to be some combination I mean we are we are in the pre iPhone days of the smartphone here with your with your television and it's anybody's ball game who's going right. to con who's going to be the dominant player in that business Boy, think about this. When you and I were five years old, there was ABC, CBS, and NBC, and that went, and sort of and PBS. And right? 11, K so, so now, KPLR. Exactly. So think about it for kids born today. They're going to grow up in a world where their networks, their understanding of networks, will be PlayStation, Xbox, and Netflix, uh, and, and YouTube. Oh, and kind of Hulu, or Hulu Plus, or whatever. I mean, it's amazing to see how everybody's jockeying for position when when... I, I would say it's the Wild West, but in the Wild West, there were no laws, and they were honest about it. They're like, there's no laws. You, I've got the bigger gun. Now give me your land. But, but weirdly, we've got these legacy laws that just don't even make sense in this new world, and it's amazing to watch people jockey for position in it. Micra, or uh, Hulu, what do you think of this Hulu face match? Did you get a chance to, to look at this? Uh, I did. Facial recognition for Hulu means when you're watching something, uh, they can say, oh, that artist or that actor, this is who he is, John Krasinski in their example from The Office, uh, and this is all the other stuff that he's done. Now, they've only set it up for a few episodes of Glee, The Office, Wilfred, uh, Modern Family, and Lost, uh, but it's, it's kind of a cool spin on the whole IMDb thing where you don't have to look up the show and look up the character and find the name. You can just kind of click on the face and go, oh, I know that person from somewhere. What else have they done? You're talking about the Hollywood that guys syndrome. There's like this whole class of middle class uh, famous actors who have never quite been the leader. Maybe they were in the lead of something, but it's like you know them best as this small role in this other show. He's like, hey, that's the, that's the that guy. And you never know what their names are and it creates it automatically. I think this is a great idea. This is exactly the same as if IMDb had built a plug-in for Hulu 
where they had manually cataloged every actor in there because, of course, there's no expectation of privacy. You don't have to worry about that. But if, if IMDb had manually cataloged every single actor and cross-referenced everything they've done, then, of course, we think this is a delightful labor of love from hardcore fans of, uh, you know, with IMDb. But the only thing that worries us is because it involves facial recognition and because it's uh, it's automated. Um, but I, I think this is delightful. This sounds awesome. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's not like facial recognition that's a privacy violation. You're just saying, oh, that's uh, that's that character. I know them from somewhere. I do this all the time. I have my tablet sitting by me while I'm watching TV, and I see some character actor come on and I'm like why do I recognize that voice or that face and then right. I go to IMDB and I find the television show and then I find the episode that I'm watching and then I look until I see the person that you know or try to remember the name of this you know marginal character uh, and then figure it would be so so great to just be able to click on I'll, them and then I'll instantly see their their filmography this is Tom DeGossa nailed it in the chat room. He said this is essentially Shazam for famous faces. Yeah, and I, it is. That's perfect. And it, I, I want to see it go farther. I want to see Shazam for famous voices because there are certain people that I hear and I'm like, I could swear that's that's the guy. From, that's that's how Ron Perlman got on my map. I heard him in some show. I'm like, is that the guy who says war? War never changes on Fallout? And sure enough, yeah, it yeah. was. No, that'd Which, be cool. Hey, you want to have your mind blown? Go check out the IMDb entry for the original Fallout. So many amazing, famous names years before they did projects that you'd heard of. Awesome. And uh, finally, at Tube Tops, of course, uh, we're always talking about who's got what shows signed up for their services as we actually, you know, are living in an era where you can pick from Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime Instant Video, and uh, some combination thereof. Amazon Prime Video just got a shot of uh, show tunes, according to TechCrunch. Uh, they are getting a deal that adds Glee as well as Sons of Anarchy. Uh, so if those are important shows for you, you can sign up for the Amazon Prime $79 plan. And unlike Netflix, uh, get uh, two-day free shipping. I don't know Were you why. Ever into Glee? Were you ever into the Glee thing? I, You know, Glee is one of those shows where every once in a while I'll watch one, and I'm like, eh, that, that's, that's fine. But I, I, actually, I am never compelled to go back and watch another one. I actually really, really liked the first eight to ten episodes because it was this sugary candy pop outer shell and when you bit in it was the black heart of hate of humanity on the yeah, inside yeah, yeah. they were better fusion, in the first season that fusion was awesome like wow these are really evil people doing evil thing and then singing these happy songs and i thought it was delightful and then at some point they're like oh we can make more money if it's just a show about happy singing song people actually i think they're they just awesome. kind of ran out of ideas maybe but i don't know more hate more hate. Bring back the hate. You're not the first person I've heard say that. Uh, and I am. this is not the first time I've said on to Film Found. <laughs> Tony Shalhoub was in Fallout? Wow. You see? Monk. You check. Tony no, uh, Kingy, Kingy checked and he put it in the uh, to chat room. Uh, CCH Pounder from The Shield was in there. Of course, Ron Perlman was in there. A bunch of other ones as yeah. well. Uh, the original Star Wars camera, a Panavision PSR 35mm motion picture camera used by George Lucas to film Star Wars when it was just called Star Wars, uh, not A New Hope or Episode 4, was right. sold for $625,000, setting a new world record. Uh, the camera package included a pan speed motor, matte box, follow focus, uh, Moy geared head, Italian made Elemac camera dolly and lens and two 1000 foot magazines. It's I'm, I'm, I'm not going to deny it. I mean, if I'm, if I'm Richard Garriott, uh, yeah. and this is, this kind of thing is, is an, you know, an expensive car to me. I would totally buy this thing. This is not an extravagant. It's awesome. Now I know a lot of you have been sitting out there saying, Gosh, the one thing that bothers me every night before I go to sleep, the one thing that just keeps me from having a calm life and feeling fulfilled is the fact that I can't easily share the movies I'm watching on Netflix over Facebook because of that outdated 1988 privacy law that tried to protect people after court nominee Robert Bork had his video rental records given away. When are they going to modify that law? You can rest easy now. Because the House of Representatives on Tuesday passed legislation that updates the video privacy laws so they can obtain your consent once a blanket time over the Internet and therefore allow an RSS feed of your movies to be shared with Facebook. Uh, uh, yes? Brian? You're, you're going to say on the movie dash draft. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, no, but this is that this is that thing. They made a big deal at the at the F8 conference. Like, you know, we'd like, we're going to roll this out worldwide, except in the U.S., where they have this outdated law. So now they've changed the law so that your Netflix feed can be shared on Facebook. But there's a few people out there saying, we're not sure this is such a great idea because they've made it a little too easy to get rid of your video rentals. But Don't care. Don't care. Yeah. If it's a problem, then take it up with Netflix. Why is the government involved in any of this crap? This is stupid. If it's a rescinded... In general, if well, it's... Well, the, the government was involved. The government had to fix the law that they put in place in the first place. Right. Okay. But I'm going to say, like, in general, if, if I hear that a law has been lifted, in general, I'm happy. All right. That's good. Mr. Libertarian. What was our wizard? All right. You. <laughs> uh, also, a watch it button is coming, uh, according to TechCrunch, from a new startup called Plexus Entertainment. I find this really interesting. So you're going to be able to... Click the watch it button, and the idea is that different uh, movie companies advertising their movies or television show websites would have this. And when you click it, it'll give you the option to go find and watch the movie. So it'll tell you not only if it's available on Netflix or Amazon or iTunes, etc., but it will also tell you if it's in the theaters where you can go buy tickets to it. So they're trying to appeal to all fields. Like, want to watch a movie? We'll tell you how to watch it no matter where it is in the world. And if you're like, well, I don't really want to watch it right this second, you can add it to a queue. So you essentially bookmark it to go check on it later, and you can customize it to have it send you uh, notices saying like, hey, this movie has left the theaters, but it's now available on Amazon, or it's now left Amazon, but it's now available on Netflix, and be able to track that movie that you've been wanting to see and easily find it whenever. And now, of course, now this service is, of course, free to anybody, uh, free to the user, yeah. and they make their money on all the tracking information and the, and the uh, information they accrue as they do it, right? Yeah, that's the idea is they're going to provide all the data uh, so your your video watching history, your video watching it, uh, clicking history, uh, will then uh, be shared with movie companies so they can get an idea of why people are choosing stuff, what kinds of people want to choose something that's similar to something else, all, all that kind of information. All right, I, I think this is the best of all worlds because what's the number one complaint that people have with new media and, and the new distribution channels available is they hate keeping track of what's available where. And I told you about how frustrating it was to try to find the fantastic Mr. Fox. I would love a service to exist and live at no cost to me that all it did was keep track of who's got what when and where you, you could. This is an extraordinarily valuable service. I hope this takes off. Yeah, I hope it catches on. There, there's some resistance. They've actually admitted. The company has admitted. We have some resistance from movie companies who are afraid this is going to eat into their ticket sales, and we're trying to show them because we, sh we say you can go watch it in the theaters. You know, we're, we're basically embracing the trend. You can't fight the future, so, so yeah. take advantage of it, uh, and hopefully the movie industry buys that proposal. Uh, let's check in on the Frame Rate NSFW Show Winter Movie Draft. So, this week we my actually... Brief, my brief reign, I still cling to the Iron Throne, Merritt. You'll I know. Like I'm, okay, so it's, it's some interesting math going on. Brian's still in the lead. I'm, I'm hot on his heels, number two. Justin just behind me, uh, number three. And this week uh, we saw the sitter just take a dump for Justin Robert Young, $10 million. Well, New Year's Eve didn't do that much better for Glenn, opening weekend, $14 million. And this week coming out, I've got Alvin and the Chipmunks. It's make or break for me. Glenn Rubenstein has Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows. There is Both no of these way. should be big dollar items, don't you think? Okay, well, first of all, let's take a look at what Glenn has past Game of Shadows. For Game of Shadows to be significant for Glenn, Game of Shadows is going to have to make uh, two hundred and thirty million dollars, and I don't think it's got the juice to do it. You got well, nothing. That and all of his previous movies, because that's his last movie, would have to make two hundred thirty. And yeah, even with his past movies, I don't right. think he's going to do so, it. So I'm, I'm going to call it Glenn's out. Sorry, Justin, Glenn. I don't think he has any chance with the sitter suddenly resurging and becoming a a hundred and sixty million dollar movie. So, so he's out. Uh, I, I'm convinced there's no way. That Chipmunks plus Tin Tin makes less than a hundred million dollars for you, so that means I'm out. Which means this is a two-person race, Tom. It is you and Sarah. So it's basically yeah, but Sarah's I, got forty-six million with two movies left: Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and Mission Impossible. Both of those would have to make to catch you. Both of those would have to make a hundred fifty million apiece. She'd have to make three hundred million total. 
because uh, it seems like, well, maybe Hugo can contribute a little bit to that, but most of her movies were so early that they're I not contributing I anything significant. I think you got this thing. Now, Now, first of all, I do think there's a strong probability that Adventures of Tintin will take a dump in America because... Uh, yeah, I, because I'm kind of counting that one out. Yeah, but, but but it'll do well. It'll do between 30 and 80 million, right? Oh, I, no, Adventures of Tintin, uh, that'll do like 10. No way. 10 Stop or 15. No way. Yeah. No, it's, but it's Alvin and the Chipmunks could, could make 80 or 90. Yeah, well, okay, I'm going to call it. I'm, if, if I'm a betting man, I would say that I'm giving it's it. It's going to be oh. down to the wire, though. I have a feeling we'll still this be talking a, this about this the week draft. before CES. This is a really good draft. I'm glad the way it all came out, man. Well, and, and what I like is it's pitching three different strategies against each other. Your strategy of buying early and buying bulk could right? pay off. I know you're counting yourself out, but you could still squeak through and win this. There's the, you're, you're far from mathematically out. Uh, my strategy of buy the big winner, which is how Sarah won over the summer with Harry Potter, and then mm -hmm. collect some others around is, is looking hopeful, but it has yet to be proven this week with Alvin. We'll see what happens. Uh, right. And then Sarah's strategy of hold your money and buy the big names at the end while scattering some others across so that you're evenly spaced also looks like it could pay off as well, depending on how, how well those last two movies do. Um, yeah, I just feel real bad for Justin. He's really pissed off that he co-created this game and has yet to, to place, win, place, or show. He's not But that's there. why we just have to keep playing the game. <laughs> it's the only way to make things right, Justin. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's right. Keep playing the game. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, uh, Netflix.com. Of course, uh, we talk about them all the time on this show, but they are a sponsor of the Twit Network, uh, full disclosure, and you can get a free 30-day trial at Netflix.com slash Twit if you want to take advantage of the service and watch it, or if you want to let somebody else give it a try. Uh, it's unlimited streaming of movies and TV shows over the internet, and they, they play not just on your laptop, your desktop, they play on your tablet, they play on your smartphone, a lot of TVs have the app built in, you can use it on all the major game consoles, PS3, Sony, uh, Nintendo Wii, Xbox 360, so check it out, netflix.com slash twit, and we thank them for their support of frame rate. Let's take a look at what we're watching. I mean, what are we watching? I mean, what are we watching? What all right, I'm watching. watching. I'm calling it. I'm calling it. Uh, Jason, it's time to switch it up again. I've, I've had enough of that intro. I'm ready for a different what we're watching intro. All mm. right. What we're watching next time will be a different intro. But this Challenge. time, you're watching the Three Stooges TV movie? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. you got to set this up. Let's dial it back. Okay. First, okay. Let me get the easy ones out of the way. As you know, Spaced came to uh, Netflix Instant Streaming recently. And, of mm. course, uh, Spaced, uh, Edgar Wright directed it and uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And uh, everybody speaks of it so reverently. I've watched... Uh, half dozen episodes now and um the parts i like best of it are not the parts that it's best remembered for it's like I, I understand what they were going for and i understand that television was in a different place in the late 90s but the parts i like the most are the genuine parts and i feel like it keeps going back to the conceit of this sort of bizarre postmodernism for it i'm going to keep plowing through it but i keep having to remind myself that many of these things were not cliche in geek world back in the late 90s. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. No, that does. I, I follow you. All right. So, uh, but the, uh, the, the Fairley Brothers, Three Stooges preview dropped this week, and it is highly polarizing. It has half thumbs up, half thumbs down on, on YouTube, and I watched the whole thing, and I was so conflicted about how I felt with it that I kept showing it to other people to ask what they, they felt. <clears throat> and in the end, I think I found it uh, staggeringly authentic to the way I remembered the the Three Stooges being, where it's like it's extraordinarily cheesy and it's silly and it's physical comedy and you got to roll your eyes at part of it. It's vaudeville made live in front of your face. Uh, and it's one of those things that, um, uh, that will that be a success nowadays? I, I don't know, but it just got me thinking about the Three Stooges in general. And somebody on my Google Plus uh, pointed out that he just watched the made-for-TV movie around, in, made in 2000 that had, uh, to, to my shock, Mo was played by, uh, what's his name? Something Ben Victor. You've seen in a million other movies. He was the Greek. The, the guy, or no, no, not, not the Greek, but the, the right hand of the Greek in The Wire, season two. Okay, you, yep. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I know who you're talking about. I can't remember his name either. Right, okay, but that guy plays Mo. Um, uh, Curly is played by Michael Chiklis, the thing, or, uh, or Sergeant Vic Mackey from The, from the Shield, uh, who does an amazing uh, version of Curly. And, uh, and then um, 
uh, Shemp was played by uh, John Kasser. And I was like, why do I know that name? And then I was like, oh, that's right, because I just did a gig with him at the Seminole Casino two months ago. I oh, hung wow. out. This is the guy who, played, who did the voice for the Crypt Keeper. And it's like, like, we hung out just the other night, and it was a very odd moment to be like, why do I know this name? Oh, that's right, we hung out just the other day. So um, it, it was shockingly good. I learned things about the Three Stooges, how they were discovered, how they were, and, and uh, I actually, looking at the IMDB, it sounds like for the most part, they they played it pretty close to the, the facts of the stories. Wait, in, uh, in the TV movie or in the, the trailer? Because now I'm confused, because there's a trailer for a movie coming out this summer, uh, but then there's the a, you're, you're talking about a TV movie that was made a while back, and it, is it a correct. document? Is it like a the story of how they? It's, yeah, correct. Yeah, it's, okay, it's inspired right. by true events. It's it's the story. The the one I'm talking about with the actors I just mentioned, though that is the made for TV movie from 2000 about the story of the Three Stooges, how they got discovered, how you know they they didn't have the rights to any of their content, and eventually got sold off for pennies on the dollar for television. And the the redemption at the end was that they were able to start touring again uh, because they were incredibly popular and here they were down on their luck but it turns out that a whole generation of children grew up watching their shorts because they were essentially free on on television uh, i found it weirdly inspiring i i really enjoyed it and you can see it on sony uh, crackle go to you got to go to crackle and type in the three stooges and the cover shows michael chiklis dressed up as curly i i dug it surprisingly much I was just watching last night, uh, I, you know, a lot of shows are on hiatus, so I'm, there's not too much actually watching on regular old TV, uh, but we were watching Anthony Bourdain's holiday special for No Reservations. That is absolutely worth a watch. Uh, go find it, uh, either rerunning on the Travel Channel or uh, get it on iTunes. Uh, it is hilarious. It's a, it's a dark, dark uh, strange, twisted tale where he gets run out of his apartment at the beginning and he has to find a hotel room alone. There's a hilarious cameo appearance from Samantha Brown, who he constantly badmouths in No Reservations, and she just swears like a sailor at him uh, and, and shoots him. Uh, it's just... I, I, it, it's amazing, and yet there's also the normal Anthony Bourdain, like takes you to a crazy, re cool restaurant uh, and shows you some amazing food. Now, I, I've only seen half an episode of No Reservations, so I really don't have a good handle on what the show is about. I, in my mind, I want to perceive it as a foodie show. Is it a foodie show? It's sort of a foodie show. It's a, uh, if you like irreverent people walking around, uh, poking uh, holes in self-righteous people and showing you awesome things to visit and eat, uh, you're going to like no reservations. Bourdain, Bourdain just goes to a different location, tries to show you some of the cooler things that, that are off the beaten path that people might not otherwise try to eat or experience and give you a flavor of the area that he's visiting. So it's part travel, uh, part food, and totally irreverent. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I like the, the part I saw. I just don't feel like I have a good handle on, you know, because, like, you calling it hilarious. Don't go right into the holiday special, though, unless you just want weird. Because he, he there's a whole scene where he's watching, like, the heavy metal vegan roaster band, and they're all dressed up like Kiss and playing this, like, death metal about veganism. It's just weird. So, so it's a little bit like trying to watch NSFW for the first time. Yeah, maybe. You just come in, in the middle, and you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah, exactly. Uh, right, and if right. you've never watched Samantha Brown, the Samantha Brown part probably isn't going to be as funny uh, either. But uh, also, uh, Anthony Bourdain has uh, a show called The Layover, which is very similar to No Reservations in, in execution as far as, you know, Bourdain is still Bourdain, and he's talking to people and showing you cool things to eat uh, and places to visit. But the idea is he's showing you a lot more things in a particular place. So the episode I watched was the recent one on Miami, uh, and he just says, okay, if you've got 48 hours in Miami, here's what you do here's what you go see here's what you eat uh and here's why that's cool yeah you you might like the layover more than no reservation actually i think you'd like yeah. them both well no no no. well yeah i mean i definitely you might the get layover, more practical information out of the layover yeah no i i because that's that's the the, the real life situation i find myself in so so often whereas i've just never been into food porn and it's really weird for me working out of the gym and they have the food network on and i'm just like why would they do that that's just that's unfair <laughs> yeah, well, that's like, uh, never mind. I was going to make some porn analogy, but that's, uh, <laughs> let's instead inject ourselves with interferon.
The International Academy of Web Television will be announcing their nominees tomorrow. So you may have seen it already, actually, if you're depending on when you're watching or listening to this. Uh, but uh, December 14th, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, Shira Lazar and Ethan Newberry will be hosting an event streaming on their site. You can get to it at bit.ly slash WT Chill. Uh, but essentially, all of the web television nominees will be announced, and the award ceremony will be happening at CES on January 12th. Uh, for our holiday special, Brian, I was thinking we would just kind of spend that uh, show going through all the nominees and kind of exposing ourselves and the audience to some of the the new shows out there that you might not have heard of that are nominated not that are nominees for awards uh tom i think that's incredibly self-serving i think it promotes our own network i think that it focuses on our love of new media it's unfair and i love it yeah, Let's well, we might have some nominees, or we might not. We don't really know. A couple of our shows were submitted, but that doesn't mean they're even <laughs> no, going to no, be nominated. I, I'm going to say, like, first of all, I mean, this is something. There are there are brief moments during the show that we like to pretend to be newsmen. Other times we to pretend to be commentators. But I think that uh, this will be a fun episode in that you and I can lay ourselves out completely naked as as deep enthusiasts for what's possible in new media. I'm and I think wear clothing of, on the show. Is that no, Still you're going to be naked. You're... This is we. You could tweet that out right I don't, now. I don't Tom, think. I don't really think. He will be naked. Next I think episode. we want people to watch the show, Brian. Uh, well, I think we'll get more if you tweet out. You'll be naked next I episode. I kind of think the opposite might happen. I mean, that uh, that oh, Equus Photoshop job has not done a lot. For yeah, me. why don't everyone do an image Google search and uh, <laughs> just type in Tom Merritt and what comes up? Tell me if you want to see that next episode. Yeah. That's that's all I'm saying. Because that's, that's not what I look like. That's, that's Daniel Radcliffe's body. I do. Yeah, that's Harry Potter, folks. Now, how do you feel about searching? For <laughs> hey, man, you can call it whatever you want. The point is, it's going to come out next week on the show. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, YouTube for Xbox Live, now available for beta users. Uh, it should appear in the app's marketplace windows uh, of Xbox Live if you're a beta user. YouTube shares the same Metro UI look as the rest of the platform, features Connect support, as well as access to your Watch Later playlist, favorites, and subscriptions. So if you're messing around with Xbox Live and you want to see some of the most popular uh, videos on the web, go check it out. Did you uh, did you mess around with the new Xbox interface? Did you download that? Yeah, I've downloaded it, but I really haven't used it much, I'll be honest. Well, I played with the voice recognition stuff, and man, it's if it had happened 10 months ago, I would have thought it was amazing and a revolutionary step forward. But unfortunately, we've all encountered Siri since then. Siri, who understands your words and has a sense of humor and actually is useful, more useful than pulling out the phone and actually using your fingers to manipulate it. And the, the Xbox voice interface is not there, and there are massive missing items. For example, the fact that they have to put up a menu of saying what are the things you can say to get anywhere, and it won't search YouTube videos. It's a glaring omission that I'm glad they're going to fix, but they got a long way to go to catch up with what this little handheld device is able to do. Paid content has an interesting story about BBC Worldwide, not BBC America, but BBC Worldwide is coming to Comcast subscribers in the United States. Uh, BBC Worldwide is the BBC's commercial and overseas wing and is building up its content and sales operations for bbc.com slash news over the last couple of years. So in addition to BBC America, uh, you'll be able to get the more newsy BBC Worldwide. Also, Al Jazeera English is now available on Google TV as an app. Uh, you, you could get it in the Chrome browser before, but the app offers uh, text stories, on-demand video, and a notification ticker. So just like getting an, an app for a site that you could also get in the browser on your tablet, uh, on the Google TV, you could now get an app that you know is a little more whiz-bang and, and built for the platform. But I tell you what, man, it's amazing to watch as uh, U.S. news becomes polarized in its own very U.S.-centric kind of way. You've got, you know, you've got CNN pretending to be in the middle. You've got Fox News on the right. You've got MSNBC on the left. Uh, and then, uh, but, but they're all very U.S.-centric. Uh, you have this weird war for who's your alternate, alternate news station. You got your Russia Todays with, uh, with, with American programming uh, and, uh, you know, Al Jazeera. Uh, it, it is fascinating to, to see the, the jockeying as the tree of branding expands out farther and farther and farther to increasingly niche areas in the, in the field of TV news. But this is why I am not too worried about the fate of journalism when everyone says, oh, circulation is declining. and no, Because people are finding 
a worldwide selection of places to get their information and to get their entertainment. So the amount of news we're consuming, I would, I would wager, has not gone down one oh, little not, bit. Not remotely. If you, if you want to talk sheer volume of processed information, I got to insist that we are at an all-time high of the most amount of information being processed the, the most quickly. And we're approaching an area where, where um, uh, knowledge cleanliness, I guess, uh, 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 what would you call it? Uh, knowledge, uh, informational hygiene is becoming super important uh, from, from a branding perspective. You need to be able to say there's a reason that we trust an article from, uh, from the Washington Post, even online, much more than we trust a, a, perhaps the exact same article from something that's using a Times New Roman font, uh, you know, across the tower. Well, and, I, and what I was getting at is, is more of the video side of things where people are not saying, well, I choose between CBS, ABC, and NBC for my news options. They're saying, I choose between those three and Fox News Channel and CNN and, uh, and the Naked News and BBC Worldwide and Al Jazeera Online and NHK and Russia Today. I, I mean, the, the list is almost endless, the right, number of right. new places you have to choose your news from. So it's not going to concentrate in one area like it did in the past. Absolutely. I, I think it's wonderful. And it's a, uh, th there's a reason we do this show frame rate. And it's because of the exciting transformation that you're seeing with stuff just like this. Uh, I, I want to correct something I said about the YouTube beta being available on Xbox Live. Actually, today, the YouTube Real app went to the Xbox Live dashboard uh, preview, uh, or, or ex it went to Xbox Live. And uh, so now we also get to add to that uh, Blinkbox in the UK, iHeartRadio in the United States, uh, MSN Video in Australia, Canada, Germany, Italy, Mexico, and the United Kingdom. MSNBC.com came to the U.S. I, there's a bunch of these. That uh, Verizon Files finally arrived in the United States. Uh, and YouTube is available in 24 countries now. So, okay, now the YouTube is regardless, or did, did I hear you say Fios only? What was the story there? No, no, no. Verizon Fios TV, the 28 channels I, thing that we've I been talking that. about, that is now available in the U.S. YouTube is available in 24 countries, including the United States. Okay, so YouTube, I could go downstairs right now and explore YouTube by using yeah, the Xbox. you don't have to have the preview anymore. It's available okay, now, to all Xbox 360 owners in those 24 countries. Now, I'll tell you, that could be super huge because the ability socially, you know, when a party's winding down, we call it the Katie Dirks rule after a friend of ours. She says, whenever the viral videos start coming out, that means the party's over. But that's an important institution to represent the party getting over. When things kind of calming down, you're like, oh, have you seen this thing? And if you could just shout at your Xbox to say, like, funny cat flush toilet uh, swirly, and then it, it finds it, and then the video pops up. Uh, I, I think that could really uh, revolution because I don't want to pick up controls and say, no, wait, watch, let me find it for you. If it made it more social, that could be a, an interesting revolution in viral video watching. Comcast has said uh, that they are not considering implementing tiered data plans. Data, tiered data plans are what you see on wireless in a lot of areas of the world, including the U.S., where you pay a certain amount for 5 gigabytes, a certain amount for 10 gigabytes. Uh, they, they do, Comcast does have a 250 gigabyte cap that's sort of loosely enforced here in the United States. But Comcast Cable President Neil Smith uh, said, we don't want to nickel and dime customers at this point. I love the, the at this point, like, don't get you wrong. We will totally nickel we and dime. We might want to nickel and dime you later. All right, now. Look, uh, basically what this is, this is a reaffirmation that tiered pricing and bandwidth caps, these are, these are third rails of the Internet. You do not speak these things without the entire wrath of the Internet coming down on you. The only way they stay that way is if people continue to freak out any time either of them are broached. And I just hope that we're diligent enough that we can not be okay with these little camel nose under the tents towards, uh, towards you know, making us need laws on net neutrality. Hey, Brian, you know what time it is? What time is it? Uh, now it's knows. time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate, oh yeah. Thank you, Kuhan. Feedback comes from Rodney in Raleigh, North Carolina. I believe that's called the Iron Triangle. Oh, no, I think it's the Research Triangle. Anyway, uh, he says, Loving the show, I am a non-comic Walking Dead viewer that watched the entire series in two days at Thanksgiving. 
Maybe it was the fact I wanted to avoid the in-laws or what, but I really did not feel the slowness or letdown that everyone has been mentioning. Perhaps I do not see the issue because I watched 12 episodes one after the other. I thought the second season gave the characters time to develop and provide a view into their emotional state. All of this could provide fireworks in later seasons. Anyway, food for thought, and it comes down to the age-old question, sit-down dinner or buffet, which provides a better drama? I've never heard that uh, that parallel made before because sit down dinner, you know, eight courses long. You got to wait for each of them to come out, and maybe that makes it better. I say no, man. I'm a buffet guy. Just overwhelm me with the ecstatic joy of everything there in front of me all at once. And I, and I've you know we've mentioned several shows, Lost, of course, being chief among them. That uh, that whenever I tried to watch it week after week, I hated. Whenever I watched it all at once, I loved it. I, I no, I agree. I love the I love this analogy of a sit down dinner versus buffet. I I like both. It depends. The sit down dinner, though, I will say sometimes you're like really, you know, I like that you're bringing them out one at a time. But do we have to wait so long for the next course? I mean, well, and I let's mean, let's they already it. got the next course in the UK. Why do I have to wait for it? Uh, here's the thing. Think about this also. The buffet is an experience you have for yourself. And you don't care who's watching or who you talk to, you're going to shovel your favorite foods in your face as fast as you can. The sit-down meal, part of the reason it's paced is based on you talking to all your friends. So I can see yeah. the result. Uh, like That's why the last season of Lost was kind of cool to experience as a sit-down meal because everybody was getting the same courses at the same time and they could talk about it and interact. That was the only reason to bother to do that. Outside of that, it's buffet all the way as far as I'm concerned. Well, why don't you serve us the next course of email, Brian? Well played, sir. Hey, Brian and Tom, a few months ago on your podcast, Brian mentioned how he enjoys finding videos for his kids on YouTube, but was worried about accidentally stumbling upon into inappropriate content. For example, Dory the Explorer, Explorer dubbed with, uh, with vile language. At the time, I was working on an app with this exact problem in mind and wanted to share it with you now that it's up and running on the Apple App Store. Freaking sweet. Looking Glass Children's Videos is an app for the iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch featuring original three to five minute video for kids two to eight that lets them learn about hundreds of topics from cupcakes to hot air balloons to tow trucks and the more. Uh, all our content is designed to be fun, informational, and engaging, and we worked hand-in-hand -hand with noted psychologists to ensure that everything about our videos, from their length to the topics to how the information is processed uh, or presented, is done with children in mind. Looking Glass delivers three high-quality new videos every week to your iTunes account for a monthly subscription of $3.99. Our interface is simple and kid-friendly with the library of videos serving as a safe environment that kids can explore on their own. You can check it out at the iTunes App Store. It gives a link where you can... Download the app for free and get five example videos. You can also check out a few video snippets of the video we produced at, and he gives another link. If you have any questions, please contact me at the phone number I'm about to read now. <laughs> you know, fought, no, uh, that's uh, thank you. Enjoy the show, Brandon. Uh, that's fantastic, Brandon. I, and I'm glad to see individuals sensing that there's a market opportunity to, to give concerned parents uh, what they want uh, because I want the freedom of my kids getting whatever they want whenever they want it but I'd love to have a safe walled garden for them to do it in all right that's it thanks everybody for listening or watching you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash fr and our email address where you can send us your thoughts is framerate show at gmail.com we'll see you next time booyah booyah booyah